Awesome. So good morning. Good morning, YouTube. Good morning, TikTok. It is so good to have all of you join us. Listen, in this particular broadcast, we are going to be talking about stop playing the mind games. Stop playing the mind games. So with that being said, if you are seeing us look this way, it's because there's actually people inside here. However, you are still more than welcome to drop your comments down below. We actually had asked the amazing people inside the room here earlier on, what is one of their favorite movies or songs or story? It could be a biblical story as well that you maybe have heard this year that really stood out to you and also why. All right, I there in the comment section as well as where you guys are ultimately tuning in from. And also don't forget to like for the sake of the algorithm. All right, but thank you so, so much. Cool. So I want to show you guys a picture over here that hopefully does something. So here we see a bunch of, of sheep, right? And we see like a wolf in the midst of the, the sheep. Now, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said something very, very fascinating. No, it's not a wolf, yeah, they're at the back as well, if you look closely. Well done, love. But we're zoning in on the one here in the middle. But he said we must kind of be aware of the, the wolves in sheep's clothing. The wolves in sheep's clothing. So today, with that being said, I want to chat to you guys for the next six hours <laughs> on this topic over here, which is stop playing the mind games. Stop playing the mind games. Now, we're going to build into some things over here this morning that hopefully blesses you as it has ultimately blessed me. And, and that is this. So I think it's pivotal for us to kind of establish first and foremost, what actually is a mind game? What is a mind game? I, I personally believe that a mind game is anything that the enemy sends your way to stop you or to attempt to stop you or to attempt to hinder progress within your life or in a particular area of your life. So what are some different mind games that are out there? Not Minecraft, but some mind games. <laughs> I believe that some of the mind games that are out there is that the enemy uses some, a couple of things. Number one, in no particular order, but he uses something called fear in a huge way. Fear. And the Bible is very, very loud on the whole topic of fear. And again, in, in my opinion, I believe like the Bible is the ultimate success book of all time. Yeah. Because inside there, there are frameworks, there are patterns, there are promises, there are prophecies, everything that's pointing towards the truth, everything that's pointing towards freedom, everything that's pointing towards overflow, everything that's pointing towards increase, it's right inside the Bible. I mean, who knows? The reason why I say that the Bible is like the ultimate success book of all time is because who knows life better than the one who created it in the first place? Okay, like, for example, who knows Starbucks better than Starbucks? Who knows Samsung better than Samsung? Who knows Apple better than Apple? Who knows life better than the one who actually created the whole thing in the first place? So the Bible is an opportunity to, number one, to get to know God better. And what's, what's part of the purpose of that? So that you can actually live life. Right? He promises, one of his promises is this. He says, the plans I have for you is to prosper you. It's not to harm you. It's to actually give you a hope and a future. Now, usually sometimes when someone shares that verse, you can maybe get some resistance because people will be like, for example, but yo, you say, you say that the Bible says God's got plans to prosper us, not to harm us, plans to give us a hope and a future. Then why am I suffering the way I'm suffering? I'm so glad that some people think like that mm -hmm. because it's actually an answer to that particular question. And it comes in the form of agriculture, right? I was sharing with my lovely wife. I don't think any of you were here when we actually shared this particular little revelation that God had um, you know, sh uh, shared with us through another individual. But I learned some really nice biological words. <laughs> I think, Chuck, you'd be so proud, right? I learned some very nice biological words and I got the book out here so I can, I can give you guys a little bit of a drawing. And the two words are this. Are you guys ready for these big bombastic words? Right? The words are, the first one is graphotrophic. Mm. Mm. Nice, eh? Graphot so if you want to sound really lonely, just listen to these words. Graphotrophic. And then the next one is called phototrophic. Oh. Amen, princess. That's exactly what we meant to say. The graphotrophic and phototrophic. What that basically means is a seed has got a particular nature. Right? So, for example, if I've got an apple seed and I put it on side of this amazing wooden table over here, quick question, can it grow? Yeah. 
No. Why? Because, well, number one, it's in the wrong environment. Right? So you can pray until you blue in the face. It's not going to do anything. Why? Because there's a principle in place, and the principle is this. It needs to be put into the right environment and have the right farmer that can cultivate it and take care of it in order for what to happen. In order for it to grow, to become a beautiful apple tree. Right? I remember years ago hearing a mentor share something that was so profound. And I'll just give you like a, a little analogy over here regarding the apple seed. But if I had to have an apple seed in my hand, and I had to ask you guys and say to you, listen, what do you see? Some people might be, well, duh, I see an apple seed, right? Some people might be very sophisticated and they'll be like, wow, it's actually an apple tree, right? And both of those answers are correct. But if you look a bit deeper, there's something deeper there. If I hold up an apple seed over here, the apple seed literally has the potential to be what? To become, <laughs> to become an entire forest. That's the potential that this apple seed has. Why? Because once it gets planted and it grows into a beautiful apple tree, that apple tree has got fruits with more seed in it. And then you plant those seeds and you just carry on with the process. So that little small apple seed over here has got the potential to become an entire forest. So what's the point, will you? Right? The point is this. One of the ways the enemy steals from our lives is making you believe that what you have is insignificant. That's one of the ways he steals from us. Not realizing that if you would literally take the apple seed and plant it in the right environment, guess what, guess what the potential of that apple seed has? It has the potential to become an entire forest. But the enemy makes you believe that all you have is a seed. So what's the point anyway? The point is what? The point is to plant it in the right environment and get it cultivated and get it taken care of and getting water poured on it. And so forth. And having the right gardener who knows how to grow it. And that gardener, my friend, is called our Father. Amen. And Jesus is the vine. And we are the branches. And once you are attached to the life, the life isn't in the branch. The life is in the vine. Which implies, as long as you're attached to the vine, guess what happens? There is life. There will be fruit. There will be an abundance. There will be an overflow. There will be blessing. Right? So coming back to, but, oh, you know, you say God's got plans to prosper us, not to almost plans to give us a hope in the future. Then why am I suffering the way I'm suffering? Because of the graphotrophic nature of a seed. So, for example, a seed, you can't just leave it there. You need to do what? You need to plant the seed. Oh, let me use this side here. You can enjoy it. Thank you, princess. Okay. No problem. No, no stress. Why are we going to really sort you out? No problem. So, so over here you have a seed. There's the ground. And here's the beautiful tree. And this is the sun. You guys can tell I took art at school. Right? <laughs> I'm playing. But, but, but anyway. So the seed needs to be planted into the ground. But Jesus said something very fascinating. Jesus said this. He said, unless the kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies it remains what a single seed but when it dies it produces many seeds mm -hmm. this is why true life begins when you lay yours down and follow him mm -hmm. can we try that one again this is why true life starts when yours ends, now I'm not talking about you killing yourself or something like that, I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about you saying, listen, I've come to the end of myself, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm asking you, please, can you show me your ways? By the way, that's the number one step for breakthrough within your life. If you want to experience breakthrough in any area of your life, whether it be spiritually, physically, financially, relationally, purposefully, uh, family-wise, in any area of your life, Jesus actually gives us the blueprint on breakthrough and it's found in Matthew chapter 5 he says this he says blessed are the rich in spirit no he said the poor in spirit by the way not the poor financially but the poor in spirit for what happens because once you come to the end of yourself and you realize that you are actually poor in spirit that you can't save yourself guess what happens heaven becomes the influence over your life 
Because he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you go and read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see two kind of concepts regarding the kingdom. The one is the kingdom of God, and the other one is the kingdom of heaven. Both of those, they sound the same, but they are different. The kingdom of God refers to God's method of doing things. The kingdom of heaven refers to a place, a realm. Does that make sense? So, for example, right now we could say we're in the kingdom of Tilburg, right? Because we are here in Tilburg. Make sense? Right? But there's some ways that things get done in Tilburg that might be different to other ways. Make sense? So the kingdom of God is God's method of doing things. The kingdom of heaven is a place. It is a realm. So Jesus is saying that. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, those that know they can't save themselves. For theirs is heaven's influence over their life. Isn't that fascinating? Basically, it means that, okay, cool. You've, you've kind of knocked your head against the wall 556 times plus 10, right? And you realize that your way ain't working. And one of the things we encourage people to quit is this, because there are some things we need to quit in life, right? One of those things are we need to quit working so hard on things that aren't working. Some of the big things we need to learn to quit, right? For example, what does not work? Unforgiveness does not work. Bitterness does not work. Those are all uh, fruits that you will find laying on the wide road, not the narrow road, right? Cool. So the graphic trophic nature of the seed. So the seed has to die. The structure of the seed has to die. For example, we have our precious daughter at the back there, Eliana, right? At some point, she was one week old. And then guess what needed to happen? She needed to leave the one week behind and go into week two and then go into week three and go into week four. For example, us as people, you have, you have your past, you have your present, and you have your future. This is one of the reasons why you need to let go of the past. Because if you don't let go of the past, guess what happens? You relive the past away in your present, which means what? Your future will look like what? Your past. It's one of the reasons why we need to get healed. It's because otherwise, if you don't, you relive the past away in your present. And guess what? As soon as I said that, that already became the past. Because time is moving like this. Little side note as I digress quickly. Chuckle, you sent us a message yesterday for our anniversary, right? And you sent something in the message that says, how time flies. But isn't it strange that when we were younger, time didn't fly, it actually went slow. <laughs> isn't that something strange? Have you ever thought about why? Well, I believe it's got to do with the perspective. Because think about it. When you're five years old, and two years have passed, what does that mean? That means that two years, almost half your life is gone. So it's perspective. All it has to do with perspective. For example, some person will see an opportunity, another person sees an obstacle, another one sees obscurity. All depends upon perspective. For example, if I, if I have a big pen and I draw a number six here, I can see a six, but Dolly, you can see a nine. All based off of where you are sitting. This is why I believe prayer and praise and worship is so amazing and such a valuable thing that God has given unto towards us. Why? Because it lifts you above the current situation. Because it's so much clearer where He is. If you do a study on eagles as well, eagles is one of the, the eagle is the leader of the bird kingdom, right? Like a lion is the, the leader of the animal kingdom, is the king of the jungle, right? The leader of the bird kingdom is the eagle. And how does an eagle operate when there's a storm? An eagle actually lifts itself up above the clouds to soar above the storm. And this morning I was just reminded by God, thank you Jesus, there's a really powerful picture where, and it brings, such, it brings home such a beautiful point, where there's an eagle and he's got a snake. And he's got the snake in his mouth, right? But the eagle isn't fighting the snake in the snake's territory. The eagle brings the snake into his territory, and that's where he defeats it. Amen. So you don't fight the enemy in his territory, mm. right? Through your own will, or through your own way, or through your own words. No, you don't do that. You fight him in Christ, right? Therefore, the Bible instructs us to set your heart and mind on things above where Christ is, because that's where your victory is. Hence, the enemy's biggest tool that he uses is something called ignorance. 
keeping you in the dark of what? Of who God truly is. And then gets you all stuck up in religion. Little side note on religion. Do you know when the first religion was birthed? This is going to be hopefully an eye-opener. If you go do a study in the Bible, you can actually see when the first religion was birthed. The first religion was birthed in the book of Genesis. Why? What happened? Adam had deceived, uh, sorry, uh, Satan had deceived Adam and Eve. They ate the fruit and fell. And something called hedonism was started. Hedonism is what? Is it, it is the pursuit of pleasure. Right there in the beginning. And think about the temptation the enemy sent to Eve. Think about it very, very clearly and carefully. Satan literally told Eve that for you to be like God, you must disobey him. Like that doesn't logically, logically doesn't make any sense. And by the way, the enemy is doing the exact same thing today, deceiving people. I know because he tries to deceive me too. Because I'm also on a journey, like every person seated here today. But what does the enemy do? He says, listen, if you want to have freedom, don't do it God's way. Do it your way. If you want to have liberty within your life, if you want to experience abundance within your life, don't do it God's way. Do it another way. And the Bible says there's a way that appears to be right to man, but in the end, it leads only to death. My friends, I can, here's, here's a little revelation to end of 2023, right? God's way actually works. You can save yourself so much time, so much money, so much resources by just understanding that one little revelation there. And by no means will I say I fully grasped it because I still make the mistake, right? But God's way actually works. The problem is a lot of the time people know what the Bible says, but don't know what it's actually busy saying. We can quote verses, but what does it actually mean? Right? And could it possibly be the reason for that is because as people, as society, we have began to value benefits more than we value transformation. Yeah. I'm going to try that one again. We tend to value benefits over transformation. And then the Bible says something that messes us up. <laughs> In a good way, of course. <laughs> messes up our little plans and our little schemes will be put together and just completely obliterates it. Why? Because God loves you too much to see you go back into bondage. So what does he do? He's willing enough to say no. Yesterday, was it yesterday, love? I was sharing with my lovely wife and you look so beautiful again to us. Well, mommy was rocking the things there, I say. Right? I was sharing with my lovely wife yesterday or the day before yesterday. You know what? In my, obviously, God is all powerful. The God is omnipotent, meaning He's all potential, all powerful. But I believe one of the reasons, just for the sake of this conversation at least, one of the things that makes God powerful, listen very carefully, one of the things that makes Him powerful is that He doesn't need your admiration. Yeah. Was it yesterday? Was it yesterday? You know, you know how big that is? Do you realize how your life would literally explode if you'd stop needing the admiration from the people beside you? Your life would literally explode to a whole new stratosphere. Right? Because why? Because you realize, and how do you get to that place? You get to that place by understanding and getting a clearer revelation and sight of the love that the Father actually has for you. Yeah. And therefore, you can be just like Jesus. I didn't say be Jesus. I said just like him. Like Jesus in what? Where it says in Philippians chapter 2, where we are instructed by the Bible to imitate Christ's humility. And it says, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider himself equal to God. In fact, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant. You know, it's one of the big things that causes relational conflicts and challenges. And let me put it to you differently. One of the big ways it causes unnecessary relational conflict and challenges is because people make themselves something. And then what happens then? Pride kicks in. And where there's pride, there will be what? There will be strife. And if you look at both pride and strife, what is the middle letter in all those words? I. I. You see, that's the problem. Okay? So coming back to this. Is this all still making sense? Are you guys all still, yeah. still with us here? Okay, cool. So, but where you say God's got plans to prosper us, not to harm us, plans to give us a hope and a future, but I'm suffering. I'm going through all this thing. Because the graphic trophic nature of the seed implies that when a seed is planted, 
as an arrow there. The graphotrophic nature of a seed implies that it grows away from gravity and towards darkness. Why? Because roots need to take place. Do you guys see the picture? The roots. And what's the purpose of the roots taking place? For the tree to have the right foundation. So that when the other challenges, the other winds and the waves begin to come, the tree is able to do what? Fall flat on its face. No, it's able to stand and continue to produce fruit. Because that is in the phototrophic nature of the seed. The phototrophic nature of the seed is when it grows away from darkness towards light. Do you guys see it? So that's part of the reason why we go through certain pains and certain issues when you do follow Christ. Is for the roots to go deep down into his love. That you don't draw life from something that's not giving you life. That's one of the key lessons for me at least for this year. Stop drawing life from the thing that doesn't give you life in the first place. Do you realize that what God gave every single person inside this room and every one of you watching online. Do you realize the things that God gave you? Guess what? Hopefully this, is a, this, this changes your whole life. Thank you, Jesus, as it has done for me. Do you realize that the stuff that God gave you, the world didn't give it to you? Do you realize how liberating that statement is? That means that if the world didn't give it to you, if God gave it to you, that means the world can't take it from you. Therefore, the result of that is what? Hope. And when you have hope, guess what? It's a lot easier to love difficult people. <laughs> Thank you, love. So what easier? I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's easier. Why? Because you have hope in your soul. Because like we shared before, hurt people do what? They hurt people. That's one of the reasons why it's so important to get healed. And by the way, the only one that can heal you, the only one, only, only one, circle it in 14 different colors. The only one that can heal you is the one that gave you life in the first place. Just like, for example... Many people today, you know how they end up living their lives, and it's not a judgmental comment, it's just a comment on observation, also based off of my story. Because before people think that, oh, but you think you're better than other people. No, 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 no. I'm telling you stuff that I have personally experienced that completely transformed my life. 11 years ago, I was sitting in the back of a police van, lost. And Jesus transformed my entire life. And all my life, I was looking to get healed. I was looking to be made whole of all the pain of the past. I was looking for freedom. I was looking for a father my entire life. And Jesus is the answer. I've tried everything that this world has to offer. I've tried it all. Everything left me empty. Why? Because you're never supposed to draw life from things that don't give you life in the first place. Right? Bible says, Psalm 27 verse 10, Though my father or mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Because you're supposed to draw your life from the source, not the resource. Like for example, if the phone is flat, what do you do? Chuck it away and think it doesn't work. No, you find the right charger and you plug it in to a place where there's what? Where there's power. And where there's power, guess what's going to be the result? The phone is going to be charged. And once the phone is charged, guess what can happen now? It can actually be true self. And this, guess what that means? That means it can actually now fulfill its purpose. Cool. So, coming back to this over here, and what the enemy wants to make people believe, <coughs> or rather where he also tempts people, is in four particular areas. And I hope this also blesses you as it has done for me. But in four particular areas. Let me have a quick slip here. Are you guys still okay? You're getting something. Okay. So if you open up the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, you'll see a, a beautiful story over there. And by the way, it's a true story. It actually happened. Right? You don't have to guess with the Bible. And this is also, by the way, one of the places where the enemy tempts people because then people start asking questions, but, but man, man wrote the Bible. Okay, cool. So why do you believe science then so much? Man also wrote those books. This one was inspired by the Spirit of God that came upon people and lived within people in order for them to jot that down. And I know that that book is real because it completely transformed my entire life. Because those words inside there, they're not just words. Those are words from God Himself, the Creator of everything from my Father, our Father, all creation's Father. Right? But Matthew chapter 4, Jesus now goes into the wilderness 
and, and by the way, all of us inside this room, as well as over 8 billion people on the earth, are going to go through a time of wilderness where there will be a tempting that takes place within our lives. It happens to everybody. If it happened to Jesus, <coughs> guess what will happen to us also? If it happened to our master, our teacher, the one we follow, our Messiah, it will happen to his followers too. But you know what's amazing? If I go and look at the Apostle Paul, it's like one of my heroes in the Bible, right? The Apostle Paul. I was reading a verse yesterday and this morning in Philippians chapter 3. But the Apostle Paul says something so profound that completely obliterates some of our attitudes within life at times. And he says, I'm paraphrasing, but he says something along the lines of, I, I hope to, to experience the resurrection power of Jesus, and listen to this, and share in his sufferings. Ooh! What is it? Share in his sufferings. How many of you have said those words before? Lord, I want to share in your sufferings, Lord. Nobody says that. But yet, one of the early leaders of the church, that was his goal. Why? Because there's, some, there's something about going through the wilderness with God where you encounter an aspect of God that deepens your roots into the ground over there. That now, once you come out on the other side, my friend, nothing will ever move you again within your life. Nothing. Why? Because you saw God literally deliver you out of the valley of the shadow of death. You've, you've known a side of me. So now, when we're singing, you got my hands in your nails, God. And like, you're singing that song from a completely different place. Why? Because you've actually seen His hand deliver you through stuff that should have killed you. Stuff that should have destroyed you. Right? Side note quickly, inside this room at least, I can't speak for the people online here, but at least for the people inside this room here, God has protected you from things that you aren't even privy of. Like you'll never even be fully aware of the stuff He's protected you from. How do I know? Well, for example, our lovely daughter, there's some things that we protect her from that she's not even aware of. Right? But we, by God's grace, are protecting her from that place. So how much more us over here? Like this, sometimes like you feel so bad, for example, for, for maybe, and I'm not, I'm not uh, vouching or endorsing, you know, arriving late or anything like that. But sometimes like if you are a person who's like genuinely punctual, like you usually arrive on time and whatnot, and you just happen to come late the one day, I believe like there was like a reason why you ended up being a bit late that particular day. Because perhaps maybe God was protecting you from an absolute maniac on the road that was going to mess the whole thing up when you had to come at exactly that particular time, Right? I've, I've seen God do this in my life personally so many times. Where like I'm really aiming to be there on time. And then I get something, there's some detour, or something that happens that just messes the whole thing up. And now I'm running late. Now I feel bad. And then when I arrive there, I realize, wow, God, you actually protected me from something major within my life. For example, I'll give you one analogy of this. A couple of years ago, we were also having church in a, in a living room somewhere in Gazina side. And lo and behold, I had to go pick up people in Volna, which is in like Pretoria North side, to go and drop them off there. And we were asked that morning to go and share a message at uh, another church here in uh, every, it's called Every Nation, here locally in, by the Grove Mall. So lo and behold, that morning I was like, I was running late. And it was like similar weather to this, it was raining a bit. So now I'm running a bit late, I dropped the people off. And I'm driving to go and preach by this other church. We're doing two sessions, like an Afrikaans one and an English one. So we're on, our, we're on our way, and I'm driving on the M4 highway. On the highway, not, not the sideway, like the highway. Next thing, I'm in the fast lane. I'm going a bit fast for a rain day, right? I lose com complete control of the vehicle. The vehicle starts doing turns like this. It smashes into the highway on the other side of the road, swivels all the way back, smashes into this barricade. Eventually, I rip back onto the road, and I'm in the slow lane on the other side. All I could remember saying in that car while it was turning like this I was saying, Jesus is king, Jesus is king, Jesus is king, Jesus is king. I believe if I had to be a couple of minutes earlier, there may be, listen, there was no other car on the highway that morning that I crashed into. No other car. That was the enemy trying to kill me. But he couldn't because my assignment isn't finished and God's hand is over my life. So there's some things to do here for the Lord Jesus. Right? So he couldn't, he couldn't kill me there. But if you had to see the car, you'd be shocked. And by the grace of God, we arrived there on the other side. The car was an absolute, it was total. It was messed up, the whole thing. We then preached the two services. Afterwards, I told the people, listen, can someone give me a lift home? Because I was actually in an accident before we came here, <laughs> right? 
and Jesus protected us. So many times this has happened, not, not in accident wise, but in the perspective of I was running a bit late and things happened and so forth, right? Because God, God is eternal. We live in time. God is not live in time. He's eternal. The Holy Spirit lives with us in time, but yet he's still eternal. Make sense? So God's got a way of doing things that is far beyond what we could ever even ask or think or imagine or fathom within our lives. Anyway. So the enemy tempts us in like these four particular areas, and they're all in the letter, starting with the letter A to hopefully make them memorable for you guys. The first one is the area, in no particular order, but the area of ambition. The area of ambition. Remember what he did to Jesus? He brought, excuse me, he brought him up to this high place and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world. And the enemy said to Jesus, don't you know that the authority has been given unto me? Side note, who gave Satan the authority of those kingdoms in the first place? Adam. Adam gave it away because that's what we gave up. We didn't give up a religion in the garden. Mm. We gave up authority in the garden. Mm. Right? But praise God, Jesus came, the last Adam, to restore that authority. So now if you are under him, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto us as well because we are under his authority. By the way, you know what that means? It means it makes you very powerful. Mm. <laughs> Because you're under his authority, okay. not your own authority. That's where the problem comes in. Yeah. But you're under his. Once you're under his, you can now go. That's why it says his name, right? For example, my lovely wife, she carries my last name. We have become one. How have we become one? Through a relationship. So now she carries my name. And covenant. And covenant, right? And by the way, a covenant is, like Mama Lina shared the one time, a covenant is way deeper than a contract. By the way, did you guys realize about a contract? In modern days, a contract is actually there for the purpose of because, sorry, the contract is there because you actually don't trust the person. Yeah. <laughs> so a contract is basically built off of distrust. So you're saying, I have a contract with you because I don't actually, you don't say it to their face, of course, because we've been taught to say the right things to each other, right? But here's a contract, I'm giving this to you just in case you don't pay me on time. <laughs> but a covenant, a covenant is built on what? Love. And when God cut the covenant with us, he swore unto who? Himself. Mm. This is why you can trust his promises. Mm. Because he swore unto himself. Mm. For there was no one greater for him to swear by. Mm. Okay, anyway. Mm. So the enemy tempted Jesus in the area of ambition. And by the way, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, I can give all of these to you. Quick question. Is there something wrong having all the kingdoms? No. But it was the wrong way to the right thing. Because the right way to having all the kingdoms was through what? Through obedience to the Father. Psalm chapter 2 says, Ask of me and I'll give the nations as your inheritance. The ends of the earth as your possession. Psalm chapter 2. Right? So there's nothing wrong with the kingdoms. But it was the wrong way, because Satan was saying, listen, do it, don't, don't, don't do it the Father's way. Do it his way. Side note, whenever Satan lies to you, it's not so that your life can become better. The purpose of his lies is to steal, to kill, to destroy. That's the purpose of it. It's not so that you can, so he can hide you from some harm. No, 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 no. It's to destroy your life. That's the purpose of his lies. It's not like a little white lie. No, a lie is a lie, right? Yeah. It's a lie. And it's there to destroy your entire life. Which implies the exact opposite is true with God's word. Everything he says inside there is not to restrict you, it's to protect you. It's to provide for you. It's to make a way for you. It's to make a way where there seems to be no way. Because it's on the narrow road where life is found. Not the wide one. The narrow one. Right? So the enemy tempts, him in the, tempts us all in the area of ambition. And you know one of the ways he does this? is by trying to get you to abort your calling. He tries to get you to abandon what God has actually called you to do. And you know what's one of the ways he does that? By making you believe that nobody will listen to you in the first place anyway. Why would they listen to you? Well, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. <laughs> right? My lovely wife has got so much amazing, beautiful things to share, and it's so amazing seeing her step more and more into that particular calling. Right? Because the enemy doesn't want you stepping into all that God has for you. Why? So he can keep you in bondage. 
This is why I believe it's so important to have your own devotional time with God. We were sharing with a, a company this past week by God's grace, telling them that it was mostly just men inside the room. We were telling them, yo, listen, I would suggest you should really genuinely take the time to go and become quiet with God. Like, not religiously, like, love yourself enough to actually take that time and go and spend that time alone with God. And if you want to really help people within your life, help people after you have been helped. What does that mean? That means, like, for example, when you're on an aircraft, right, and they, what are the, those aerostasis, they're like, they point in there, and then they, they say, listen, when those masks drop, put them on your child first. No, they don't say that. They say, put the mask on who first? On yourself. Why? Because you can't help somebody else if you're not busy dying. Put the thing on yourself in the midst of the chaos when you have the oxygen mask on, then you can help other people. This is why it's so important to take the time to break away, to be with God. If it means five minutes, if it means two minutes, if it means an hour, whatever that looks like for you individually. But take the time. If Jesus took the time to break away, and if anyone's life was in demand, it was Jesus' life. People were coming by the hordes, by the crowds. There's the other Afrikaans who come out there. The hordes. People coming, masses coming out, trying to, and by the way, they were coming there with what? Their problems. Yet, that's, that's a tough thing to do. Every single day, people are coming to you with their problems. Every single day. Boom. And not once was like, oh, you know, I need a sabbatical. Uh, not once did he say that. Why? Because he kept the main thing, the main thing. Which is what? Getting his healing. Getting, not healing rather, let me rather use the word, getting the restoration from the Father. Because mm. from that place, there's... There's a, there's a rejuvenation that comes. There's a strength that comes. So you can be, like Psalm 1 says, a tree planted by the waters whose roots go out by the streams who never fails to bear fruit in whatever season. And whatever that person does, guess what the Bible says? It says it will prosper. Why? Because their roots have gone down deep and they get their uh, rejuvenation, their strength from the Father, meaning that they are stable as well right there. They're a tree planted okay, and they can bear much fruit. Yeah. So the enemy tempts us in the area of ambition. The next place, he <coughs> excuse me, he tempts us in the area of our appetites. Remember what he said to Jesus? He said to him, if you are the son of God, again, tempting his identity, if you are the son of God, turn the stone into bread. Okay? What did Jesus say? Jesus said, no, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So William, are you saying, I can't eat bread? No, we're just saying that the truth is more important than your stomach. <laughs> That's what we're saying. Because the word from God is more important than any of the appetites of this world. Nothing wrong with enjoying a good meal. I love to do so myself. Nothing wrong with enjoying the things that, that's out there and so forth. We all, we believe in that, right? But not at the expense of truth. Not at the expense of truth. The next area he tempts in is in the area of, oh, here's a big one. In the area of our attitudes. The area of our attitudes, right? So, for example, what did he say to Jesus? He said, listen, he brought him up to this high place. He said, listen, if you're the son of God, why don't you just jump down from here? And you can command the angels most, can't you? So he's again asking Jesus to step into an attitude of performance. you got to perform for the Father to love you. A lot of us have grown up in places where... The sole reason for you receiving love is because you performed well. And as soon as your performance dropped, you were kicked in the teeth. God's love doesn't work like that. God's love is the exact opposite. His love is unconditional. So that love doesn't leave you in your place of sin. It actually transforms you, right? For example, again, the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, the very one that could throw a stone at her, who is Jesus, didn't. And he said this to her. He said to her, neither do I condemn you. Was the woman wrong? Absolutely she was wrong. But he said, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Okay? But the enemy tempts us in the area of our attitudes. And by the way, also, a little side note, you see this a lot in our relationships. So for example, how often does the enemy get you to focus on another person's life, an aspect of their life, that you just have such resentment towards, but then you forget Quick question. Have you ever seen a one-sided couch? No. No. Have you ever seen a one-sided apple? No. No. Ever seen a one-sided uh, table? No. No. A one-sided phone? No. A one-sided nose? No. Why? 
because everything got two sides. There's some treasure also in that person. Though they don't know it for themselves, there's also some treasure there. But what does the enemy do? He gets you to focus on all the nonsense of that person. All the issues of that person. And now resentment, bitterness starts to boil on the inside. Not realizing that that resentment, that bitterness is holding who back? That person or you? You. Not that person. That person might have forgotten already that you even exist. <laughs> and now you're about, you don't know what they did. Blah, 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 blah. One of the, also the keys to breakthrough within your life is stop giving other people so much power over your life. Through blame or through entitlement or through excuses. Leave that. What they did was wrong. Absolutely yes. Let God deal with them. You're God's child. Right? Remember, if, if you have children, if you touch the child, you directly touch the parent. <laughs> because the child is supposed to be precious to the parent. So if you touch the child, you touch the parent. Now how much more with us and God? You know what's amazing about God? Like irrespective of your age, if you're like 140 years old, you will never ever become God's adult. Yeah. He'll always be his child. Like, for example, your child can be 32 years old, 40 years old, but you still see them as one. Ah, your princess, or your little prince. Barbecue. Your barbecue. Right? Okay? Because they're your child. You don't see them. Oh, no, no, no. You still see them because you, you walk the road with them for a very, very long time. Right? So you'll never become God's adult. Right? Because you're never supposed to live independent from Him. You're always supposed to live in interdependence. With him, or rather, dependence with him and interdependence with one another, right? Because not, not one person knows everything, that's why we all need each other. So, in terms of the area of our attitudes, and by the way, how does he do all of this by attacking the last thing, which is probably one of the most important things in your life, which is something called your attention? Because if he can, if the enemy can grip your attention, he directly influences your attitudes which directly influences your appetites which directly influences your ambition where you now move away then from god's grace and now you're an open target for the enemy to devour right for example again when you're brying and you have all the coals together over here if you take the one little coal and you put it here to the side that one's going to be snuffed out very quick or another example if there's a bunch of bushbuck or springbuck or whatever there's a lion they're going on the hunt if you're a lion Right? And you see there's a bunch of buck there, but there's one drifting there. Which one are you going to go for? You go for the easy target, the one over there. It's not much of a fight. Just go all the way down there. Just get an easy meal. It's like driving through by the drive through by McD's for the lion. Because it's all by itself. And the Bible tells us so often, be alert and of sober mind. For the enemy roams around like a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour. So to close it all off, like we haven't even gotten past the first slide. There are so many slides inside this PowerPoint. <laughs> There's no way you're going to get to all of them. But to close it off, and I'm so thankful that Donna had mentioned that verse about putting on the new clothes. Because the question is, okay, William, so you're talking about stop playing the mind games. How do you stop playing the mind games? I'm so glad that you guys are thinking that. right? You stop playing the mind games by how? By stop playing the mind games. By stopping it. And how do you do that? By discovering the truth for yourself. Jesus says, ask and what will happen? You'll receive. He says, seek and what will happen? You'll find. Knock and what will happen? A door will be opened for you. Right? And we were sharing with another also a company this, this past week by God's grace telling them, one of the reasons, not the sole reason, but one of the reasons why I love like studying and personal development and personal growth stuff and all of these things and learning stuff. One of the reasons for that is, would you guys like to know what one of the reasons are? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, love. One of the reasons I do that is because I hate being taken advantage of. Yeah. I hate that. I hate being manipulated. I hate being or feeling intimidated. I hate feeling scared or afraid. I hate that. So the solution is what? To discover the truth. Because you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. How many times when Jesus, when he was physically here on the earth, how many times the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all these religious leaders, these experts in the law, they came to Jesus, 
trying to intimidate him, trying to manipulate him, trying to control him. Like, it's, it's fascinating. If you go read the verses, like, you should read the Bible. Like, it's the best book out there, in my opinion, right? How many times they come, they come asking Jesus questions, right? Not for the purpose of actually discovering the truth, but to try and catch him in his words, hoping he would say something wrong so they have something to accuse him of. But there was nothing to accuse him of, right? He was sinless. And he became sin so that we who are sinful, not sinless, who are sinful, could become what? Could become the righteousness of God by simply accepting the truth that Jesus, who was God himself, the King of Kings, had to become a criminal so that we who were rightful prisoners could become kings. Oh, That's mind-boggling mm. to think of. Right? Jesus had to take... Our position, listen, so we could take his. Do you know how big that is? That's huge. Again, what is grace? Grace is getting <laughs> not what you deserve, but what Jesus deserves. Yeah. That's grace. Right? This is the thing. Then you say stuff like that and people are like, but, so you're saying God loves people. So then why does God then send people to hell? By the way, just a little side note, this might be against society and so forth, but it is the truth. Like hell actually exists. There's actually a place called hell, yeah. right? There, there's that place. So, but you know, you're saying God loves people. Why does God then send people to hell? He doesn't. People decide to go there. Because why? God has given us something called free will. Because love is a choice. I don't want, for example, my wife to only have married me because I was the only guy on the earth. Like, what a disastrous marriage that would have been. Like, it was like, she's standing there, she's reading her vows. Like, well, I'm marrying you because, like, I mean, you're the only guy that's there. So it's like, oh, whatever. I'm going to go with you. Right? That's not the purpose. The purpose of love is that love is a choice. It's a decision saying, listen, I'm deciding out of my free will to go this way with you. Yeah. Which means I cut off everything else. To go with you. I've decided to, to, to decide. I'm cutting off. I'm cutting off. Any other possibility to go with you. God desires that. Right? He doesn't want to be like, oh, well, I guess I just want to choose you. Settle. I must settle for you, God. What are you talking about? Just settling for God. He is life. Right? But people then decide to go their own way because this is the thing. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Jesus paid the price in full, not partially, like do like a well, once-off installment here and then installment there. No, it's a once-off payment that he paid. He paid the price in full for our sin because sin had a price. The wages of sin is death. Somebody has to die. Either it's going to be us or it's going to be God. You know what God did? He said, I'll do it. And he didn't send a goat. He didn't send like an elephant. He didn't send anything. He sent didn't send an angel with a broken wing. He sent heaven's best. He sent his only son, Jesus, to pay the price for that sin in full. So now you can either receive the price that has been paid or if you don't want to receive it, here's the flip side of the coin. If you don't want to receive it, then you're going to have to pay the price for the punishment that comes with that. Because there's no other price that needs to be paid. Because that thing has got a punishment. It's like, for example, if you want to purchase a car now you go to the bank you get a loan from the car from the bank right and now let's say for example you pay five thousand rand per month on the vehicle every five every month it's five thousand rand five thousand rand but now somebody comes and says you know what i love you so so much i'm gonna pay your entire car off the whole thing i'm gonna pay it off for you how will your reaction be wow thank you what a blessing or would you say or would you be prideful and be like no it's fine i'll pay it why wouldn't you receive the gift? Because if you, if you don't receive the gift, guess what needs to happen? The price needs to keep on being paid. And the thing is, with sin, you'll never be able to pay the full price. Because why? You were never supposed to in the first place. Because the purpose of the law that God had sent was to bring you to what? To the end of yourself. So you can discover your need for a Savior who is Jesus. And then you receive Jesus. The price has been paid. And now... Because you received his love, 
you naturally bear fruit for his kingdom. It's not a forceful thing. Religion is about forcing, not flowing. For example, have you ever seen when an apple is hanging on the tree and it's busy growing? Have you ever seen an apple sweat? No, because it's natural growth. <laughs> have you ever seen your phone while it's busy charging, like breaking into a sweat, like it's sweating there on the screen? No. Why? Because it's natural. All it has to do is just to abide where there's life and where there's power. For example, I'm assuming that everyone inside this room over here is South African. When you woke up this morning, were you like, you know what? Today is the day. I'm fine. I'm going to really try hard today to be South African. Or did you just wake up and you say words like lacquer and braai? And I heard you over talking with my Aunt Marie about cream soda and bultong, all these things. Because it's a part of your culture. It's a part of who you are. It's not something that's forced. It's an influence that has happened over your life and now you bear fruit of that culture. When the heavens culture comes and makes its home back inside of you again, you don't have to force anything. All you have to do is just flow. And how do you flow? By remaining attached to the vine and what he has said and what he has spoken. All right. So coming back to how does one stop playing the mind games? By putting on the new self which has been created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Last night or this morning, I don't know when it was, but I had a dream. And in this dream, there was a guy that I knew of my past. And (laughs) I'm not going to mention his name or anything, right? But in this dream, he was uh, was a guy that I, I, I know his face. In this dream, he stole something from me. And then someone tried to chuck him with dice. In Like in this dream, like this, like the weirdest stuff, right? Someone tried to chuck him with dice. But usually like when I can remember, and by the way, this can also be one of the ways you know, God, God speaks to, to you. When I, can, when I can vividly remember stuff in my dreams, I, I try and not take that for granted. So I try and figure out, is it like, God, are you, like, was it just like a subconscious thing? Or was it like, did you actually try and say something to me you know, through this dream or whatnot? So no, because through the Bible, like, there were multiple times where God spoke to people through dreams. right? Joseph, Daniel, there's multiple examples. And the reason why I mentioned that, so sorry, I, I might feel like I'm jumping, but I'm, there's a reason for that. This past week also by another company we were at, the one guy asked us, uh, so how does God, how do you know when God's speaking to you? I think it's a pretty valid question, right? Like, how do you know if God's speaking to you? And the, one of the answers was like, well, you'll just, you'll just know <laughs> that he's speaking to you. Like, there's something, like, it just resonates with you, like, like, wow. That's why I asked you guys earlier about the song and so forth, because there's something special. Like, why did you remember that? There's something, there's something there that you, there's a reason why you could recall that particular song or that particular movie or that particular lyric or that particular billboard, right? Because could it be God is trying to tell you something? But sometimes so often we are so in such a rush, we miss stuff. But God is patient and he will remind us of things, right? So dreams is one of the ways also God can obviously speak to you. And I believe that God speaks to you through his word, right? Because God will never contradict what he's busy saying inside of his word. So in this dream, this guy that I know of my past, he stole something, someone, someone trying to chuck him with dice and whatnot. And then later on, like this guy ended up getting killed and both his arms were chopped off. I'm thinking, yeah, no, what dream is this? Right? And so this morning when I was sitting, pondering and thinking, okay, Jesus is like, is there something here? And one of the things that popped up and like the thought that popped up in my head was, one of the ways the enemy steals from us is that he steals from us by using our past against us. I'm going to try again. But one of the ways he steals from us is using his using the past. And he uses that past to steal from us. Because you're thinking, oh, but who am I now really? Who are you? You are a child of the living God. You're not the drunkard William that you used to be. You're not the drug or the guy the smoking all the, the, on, on weed or whatnot. You're not that guy. You are the will of I am. It's William. Right? That's who you are. That's you. And that's, you need to hold on to the story, not that the enemy speaks over your life, but the story that the Father speaks over your life. That is the one you need to hold on to. Isn't it fascinating that it's sometimes easier to believe a lie than the truth? Like when it comes to the truth, like people are so skeptical over the truth, but over a lie, they believe it like this. What happens if you had to switch it? 
and say, Lord, I don't want to believe lies that quickly. Help me to believe your truth a lot quicker so I can stop playing these blooming mind games the enemy's trying to play with me because I'm done. I'm done playing these games. And coming back to, remember when I told you guys at the beginning of this, I said to you, like, what is one of your favorite movies for this year or something that stood out to you this year? We actually watched one of mine yesterday. And it's a movie that maybe all of you have probably watched before. And it's called Matilda. Any of you watched the movie Matilda before? None of you watched Matilda before. Okay, well, it's from, a, it's from a book by a guy called Roald Dahl who's written loads of different kiddies books. But Matilda, in this book of Matilda, Matilda's like a little genius. But her parents hate her. Right? And then her parents send her off to the school where the school, the principal over there is just hideous. Mrs. Trenchpool. Mm. Right? Have you seen Matilda Chuckle? You haven't checked it? No ways. I thought like everyone would have seen this movie. It's like a pretty famous one. <laughs> so Mrs. Trenchpool. But Matilda, she loves reading. She loves accumulating knowledge. And she's like way beyond her years, right? I mean, she's like a little grade one or grade two or uh, grade two. Right? So her parents then send to school for the purpose of having Miss Trenchpool, who's this terrible principal, like just hammer her, hammer her, hammer her. And her parents went to go spread lies about Matilda at the school. It's like a little gangster. And she's like this little thing. Meanwhile, she just wants to know the truth. And she's, she's not afraid to question you if you're wrong, right? Reminds me of my lovely wife, <laughs> which is awesome, right? And uh, lo and behold, she then meets like this really awesome teacher who's like all for like empowering the kids and having the kids like have these great learning experiences and, and all of this. And they really end up connecting in a huge way. But Miss Trenchpool doesn't like Matilda. She's like the bully. So the way I see it is like Miss Trenchpool is like Satan. Who just tries to bully you the whole time, bully you, and intimidate and manipulate you and control you and lie to you and, and tell you how, how, how stupid you are and how terrible you are. And just all these lies, lies like Matilda ain't having none of it. She's the first one to get into that school and stand up to this principal and say, no, what you're doing is wrong. And that gets her in a lot of trouble. Hence why the Bible says, blessed are those who are persecuted for what? Righteousness. Doing what's right will get you into a lot of trouble at times. But that doesn't mean you mustn't do it. You must do it. Because if you're not the salt, who's going to be the salt? If you're not the light, who's going to be the light? Yeah. Right? We're called to be the salt, to be the light, the city on the hill that cannot be hidden. So at the end of it, the power switches. And now the whole school is busy backing Matilda. No one, everyone starts losing their fear of this principle. And Matilda, then at the end of the day, she ends up winning against this terrible principal, who also, by the way, was the teacher that she got into good contact with, her stepmother, who tried to rob her of her inheritance. It sounds like stuff that happens in the Bible, right? Because what is the enemy trying to do? He tries to rob you of this glorious inheritance that God has made you worthy of. You don't make yourself worthy, right? You go to a shower to go shower, not because you're clean, but because what? You're dirty. You come to God, not because you're clean. You come to Him, why? Because you're dirty. <laughs> and then what happens? He cleanses you and gives you, like you are talking about earlier on, Donna, He gives you that robe of righteousness. He puts the, sand, the sandals back on your feet. He gives you belonging. He gives you acceptance. He gives you establishment within His family. He gives you your royal identity back, which we lost in the pigsty. Yeah. And I close with these verses. In Romans chapter 8, it says this. Okay, Romans chapter 8. If ever you are looking for Romans chapter 8, just remember it's right after Romans chapter 7. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Romans is not just a pizza place. It's actually a book in the Bible, which is awesome. It says this from verse, let's go from verse 12. It says, and by the way, there's a subtitle for the chapter. It says, life, uh, life by the Spirit, or life through the Spirit. It says, verse 12, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters. It's also just a whole other thing by itself. Because God actually wants us to be a family. It's, it's, it's one of the sad things in today is that a lot of denominations and churches and things, it's kind of like we've become gangs. Like, don't come into my territory kind of thing. Which is shocking because if you go drive to Woodlands, you'll find Chicken Licken, McDonald's, Steers, and Burger King right next to each other. No one's complaining. As far as we know. <laughs> right? 
But like churches like become gangs. Like if, if I'm not part of this church, then all of a sudden I'm shunned away. If I'm not part of this, then I'm shunned away over there. It's not supposed to be a gang. It's supposed to be a family. That's what God's purpose has been. The BB, a royal family that are ruling and reigning with him of all creation. Anyway, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. But for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That flesh is not referring to this thing over here. It's referring to your sinful nature, right? Because you've given your life unto Jesus, guess what has happened? That sinful nature has actually died. Okay? Therefore, every single day, Paul said, I die daily. To put that aside, because it's not really you. The real you is whom God has called you to be. That's the real you. Not the flesh demon. For example, people say stuff like this. They say stuff like, oh, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That's not biblical. You were a sinner. You were saved by grace. Absolutely, yes. But now you've been made the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. So that means you're going to make mistakes. No, you make mistakes. Absolutely, yes. But you got your new clothes on. So now instead of being scared to say to God, God, I messed up. And running away from him, now you can come to him and say, God, I messed up. Please help me, Father. I don't want to stay in that place. Yeah, it's sonship. It's relationship-based. It's not fear-based. Religion is always fear-based. Relationship with God is based off of faith in who He is. Not what you can do for Him. For it's Him who cleanses you. It's Him who makes you clean. It's His grace that has saved you. And that right thinking, guess what it does? It leads to right living. Because now you are flowing and not forcing. For example, you know when you go to the mall and you park the car or you get out the taxi or whatever the case is for everyone individually, okay? You park the car, you eventually get out. Now you walk to the, to, for example, we had Mall of Africa yesterday. You get out in the parking lot. Now you begin walking to the, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the doors, right? Do you have to rip and pluck the door open? Or is there a sensor at the top? that knows that you're close, and when you get there, guess what happens? It automatically opens up. Why? Because you're close. The Bible says, draw me near unto me, and I will draw near unto you. When you're near with Him, through the finished works of the cross, you don't have to force anything. It's where you find rest. Mm -hmm. And in that rest, guess what happens? You actually produce much more than you would have by your own pace. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those, watch this now, who are led by the Spirit of God, not those that are led by an opinion or tradition or the culture of the day, those that are led by the Spirit of God, God's Spirit, okay, are the children of God. What makes that verse significant? Well, there's a couple of things. For the sake of this conversation, did you hear it said that, that you are a child of God? Do you guys realize how big that is? Well, I think it's pretty big. Like, that is massive. Like, you God's child. Like, God, God, the one who created everything. Yes, you His child. So that means you don't want to mess with the person next to you. Because <laughs> that's God's child. Right? It's, it goes on to say, it says this, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. The, the adoption is not referring to what we know as adoption to be like, for example, you have an orphanage and you go and adopt a child there. All right. That's not what it means. It means that you've been established as a son within his royal family. You've been established there. So what does that imply? Well, a couple of things. If you've ever dealt with rejection, if you've ever been rejected by people before or been terribly hurt by people before, this verse over here can bring about a lot of freedom within your life. Because according to this over here, even though you've been rejected, you've been established in God's family. In His family, what does that mean? If you're part of a family, what does that mean? That means that you have belonging, you have been accepted, that you're part of something bigger than just yourself. And if you're part of his family, it means it implies that you are royalty as well. It implies you don't need to find outside admiration no more. Because why? You find it in your family. Okay? And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is the, as far as I know, it's actually the Greek word for 
Oh, the Greek word is pater, I think it is. Yeah, right? pater. Pater, yes. Awesome. Pater. Abba means uh, source or sustainer or father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. <laughs> That's good news. You're God's child. I know I'm repeating myself here, but it's for the sake of everyone here. Yeah. You're his child. You're his child. That's massive. Do you realize that that also means, or what I want to also get across to you guys is, there's no human agenda or human scheme that can override what God has spoken to you. Amen. Nothing. No matter how it looks like evil's winning or whatnot, it's not. Because even though evil tries to come against you, guess what it's doing? It's driving you deeper down into Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. So you can bear much fruit. And you come out on the other side. And now, guess what? Not only do you come out on the other side, but now you can actually be a voice of hope to the people beside you as well. Because why? As you have received comfort in your struggle, you can now give that comfort to other people too. Which puts you in what position? The position of the influencer. And that's how we begin to disciple nations. Because that's what Jesus' commission for us is. Go out into the world and make disciples of all nations. A disciple, to make disciples implies that somebody's teaching. Mm. Right? And it's the Holy Spirit that lives within us, that teaches through us, to the people beside us, through the way we live our lives, through faith, through love, through purity, through speech, through conduct, through the way we do life. And as we close, it says, now if we are, this is also a big one regarding inheritance. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, not, not heirs, but heirs mm-hmm. of God and co Listen, Did you guys hear what it said? That you an heir of God. My lovely wife and I the other day went to go just uh, catch up and um, stuff on, in, our, in our wills, right? And uh, so there's like, it's like inheritance talk, right? That they have the inheritance, all of these other inheritance. So these things are making more and more sense now to me. So it's like, hey, so you're an heir of God. It's like you, you're, the, you're, the, you're, the, you're the beneficiary. You're an heir of God. That's who you are. But this is why God wants us, because God, God's not in the business of busy, God's not in the business of cultivating spoiled brats. Yeah. This is why he's offering your transformation. And I'll advise you, there's one movie I want all of you guys to go and watch come December time. Well, we're in December, but come a bit later December. One movie I'd advise all of you to go and watch. It's called The Ultimate Gift. Mm. The Ultimate Gift. I think it'll, it'll bless you so, so much. Where again, you see, stop valuing the benefits and just value the transformation that God brings about in your life. Why? Because my friends, the benefits are already available. They are already there. It's the transformation that needs to take Remember, things change when we change. Amen. What does that mean? It means that when you are transformed, everything else seems to be transformed as well. Because why? You look at things differently now. Because the way you see things have changed. That means your attitude has changed. That means the way you approach things has changed, which means there will be different results. Mm. So now instead of seeing a problem, you see a solution in your mind by God's grace, for that problem, and everything changes. Right? Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed, watch this now, if indeed we share, here's this graphotrophic and phototrophic nature of the seed, if indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we too may share in His glory. If you share in His suffering, you too will share in His glory glory my wife knows i sleep at night so she uh, sorry i speak in my sleep at night right so she shares in that suffering (laughs) but she shares in the glory as well when we go for lunch somewhere she shares in that too there's a relationship right and 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 so she doesn't doesn't speak in her sleep at night and i won't even go there but but if we share in his suffering best belief you'll share in his glory as well Best belief. And by the way, side note, the glory far outweighs the suffering. For the very next verse, right, right beneath that, and that was verse 17, right underneath it, verse 18 says, Our present suffering is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. And I'll close with that. Did you guys get something out of this at least today? Was it, was it worth your while, hopefully? Yeah. Awesome stuff. So I hope that you guys will also take these thoughts and maybe go ponder about them and, and see what God has 
uh, for all of us moving forward. Um, someone asked us the other day, they'd like to know our thoughts on like meditation and stuff like that. And I believe part of meditation, because the Bible speaks about meditation, right? A meditation is just simply mulling over, thinking again, okay, what did God say there? And thinking about it over and over. Some people tend to meditate more on a problem than they do on God's word, right? And the Bible tells us, finally think about what is right, what is true, what is praiseworthy, what is noble, what is admirable. Think what is excellent. Think about those things. One of the best things you can do is think. Right? Think about God's things. Yeah. And eat it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Because if you think about the wrong thing over and over, guess what happens? Your brain gets washed. And they call it brainwash. Right? Now your brain needs to get rewashed with the truth. That needs to be washed by His blood over and over and over and over and over so that we can come out of the old way and step into the new way, which is the narrow road, which ultimately leads to life. Amen. Awesome. I think we're done. Cool. So if we can quickly close our eyes and bow our heads, we can pray with Lord, and I hand over to, to me. Abba Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, you are so wonderful, Lord. Thank you that we are ultimately your children, that you never leave us, you never forsake us, Lord. You are with us every step of the way. We thank you so much for every person inside this room and all of the, the people that are watching online. And Father, thank you that you know every single one of us by name. Lord, I thank you that you're not angry at us, but you actually adore us, God. You, you even admire us, Lord, even though... Yet the Lord, we mess up and, and we make mistakes and we flop and we fail and all of these things, God. You are always there. You never leave. And I pray that, Lord God, you would remind us constantly of the love that you ultimately have for every single one of us. That we can genuinely walk out this life that you've called us to walk out, Lord. Amen. Not by our own force, but Father God, simply flowing with you, resting in you knowing that by your grace that we'll be able to even work harder than everybody else, like Paul said. Thank you that your grace is sufficient for us, that your strength is perfected within our weaknesses, and therefore we can say that we are strong, even though at times we feel weak, Lord, but we are strong because your grace is sufficient. We love you so, so much, God, and I pray that nothing would move us away from you, Lord, that we can have the courage to daily stop playing any mind games, Lord God, where the enemy tries to play it with us. We won't even entertain it, Lord God. That we can focus on you. And thank you, Lord God, that you've even encamped your angels around us, Father, wherever we go. We love you so, so much. Father, we bless you. And Lord, I pray that this word that has gone out here today, that it would produce not just 30 or 60, but a hundredfold within our lives as it takes root. That you would seal it within our hearts as only you can. And Father, we love you and we just commit the way forward into your hands. We bless you and we thank you so, so much. In Jesus' wonderful and mighty name we pray. And we say amen and amen. YouTube as well as TikTok, thank you guys so, so much. If you got something out of it, I would encourage you to go and share it and also subscribe if you haven't yet done so. And thank you so much. Until next time in between time, just know that he loves you so, so much and that your voice matters. Thank you, champs.